Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, the day has finally arrived. The Oberheim OBX8 is here, and with it, Tom Oberheim's legacy of creating incredible analog synthesizers under his own original company name is back. Today, I am so pleased to bring you guys a full sound demonstration, review with pros and cons, demo song, and much, much more. But first, let's start off with some history. Tom Oberheim founded his company Oberheim Electronics in 1969. He got his start creating effects, actually, notably ring modulators and phasers. Not long, however, after he created one of the world's first digital sequencers. However, where Oberheim truly got his start was in the creation of the SEM, the world's first synthesizer module. In 1974, he released the SEM to great acclaim and followed it thereafter with the world's first polyphonic synthesizers, the Oberheim 4-voice and 8-voice, which were essentially multiple SEMs strapped together in a box with a keyboard attached. However, the era of the 4-voice and 8-voice was short-lived because in 1978, the sequential Prophet 5 took the world by storm by being the first polyphonic synthesizer to store presets. In 1979, Oberheim responded with the creation of the OBX, the first of the three great Oberheim polysynths. Following that, one year later in 1980, the OBXA was released as an improvement and iteration on the OBX. In my opinion, the OBXA is the most iconic Oberheim synthesizer, and it was used on all sorts of records, including most famously Van Halen's Jump and many songs by Prince. Finally, in 1983, Tom Oberheim released the third and final iteration of his three great polysynths, the Oberheim OB8. The OB8 was the ultimate version of the OBXA and OBX before it, and was used by numerous artists such as The Police, Nine Inch Nails, Depeche Mode, and many more. This would well and truly mark the golden age of Oberheim synthesizers, as sadly, two years later in 1985, with the release of the DX7 and the move towards digital synthesis and MIDI, Oberheim Electronics filed for bankruptcy. Today, with the creation of the OBX8, that golden age is reborn again, and all three of those iconic Oberheim polysynths are present in one simple box. What's up, Castaways? This is Miles Away, and today I am so excited to bring you this video. Let's get started, but before we do, please remember to like and subscribe if you enjoy this video. These do take a while to make, and I really appreciate it. Alright, so every single sound you just heard in that demo track was created using only the OBX8 besides the drums. And what a sound that is. For me personally, in the debate between Sequential's Prophet sound and Oberheim sound, I think while I love both, I've always been more gravitated towards the Oberheim sound. While the Prophet sound, in my opinion, tends to be a bit more woody and round and warm, the Oberheim sound is full of electricity and emotion, and almost everything you play tends to have this almost melancholic tinge to it. I'm not sure how that happens, but there really is a sound, and I hope that throughout this video, you guys will hear what I'm talking about. All right, so unfortunately, my footage for that last part got corrupted, but let's jump onto the front panel and see what this amazing synth can do. Before we do that, I wanted to give a quick shout out to today's sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes for anyone who loves learning and wants to explore their creativity and learn new skills. 
Now, I am a huge fan of learning new things, and chances are, if you're watching this video and learning about synthesizers, you probably are a fan of learning about new things as well too. Skillshare is the perfect destination for increasing your creativity, increasing your knowledge of different creative fields, whatever they may be. Now, last week we looked at music theory, which was awesome, and I used Skillshare to brush up on my music theory, but this week, in keeping with the historic nature of Oberheim, I wanted to talk about a great new course on music history that I've been enjoying on Skillshare. The course is called The Complete History of Music by Jason Allen. Now, it's broken down into many different parts and spanning across eras, it's really quite something. But essentially, what he does is he goes through the different periods of human music, medieval, renaissance, baroque, and breaks down the type of compositions they did, the types of instruments used. And, you know, as a musician my whole life, so much of this stuff was brand new for me and so fascinating to learn here on Skillshare. So because Skillshare is sponsoring this video, the first thousand people to click the link in the description will get one month of Skillshare Premium completely free to use. And not only that, you'll be helping out my channel so I can continue to make videos like this for you guys. So make sure to check that link in the description. I really appreciate it. And thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. All right, let's get back to the other footage and check out the Oberheim. So the first thing I noticed when firing up the OBX8 is the presets are simply incredible and so inspiring to play. With the OBX8, not only do you get a brand new original bank of really great presets created solely for the synth, you get all of the presets that were available for not only the OBX, the OBXA, and the OB8, but also the OBSX, which was a slimmed down version of the OBX. One of the coolest features was seeing how the same presets differed from year to year throughout the different iterations of Oberheim. I genuinely spent the first several hours with this synth just going through each of the presets and playing them and ideas simply just fall out of this thing. If I had to say my favorites, I think that the OB8 and the OBX banks are just truly amazing, but there's some gems scattered throughout. All right, as much as we could probably go through those presets all day, I'm guessing that you, like me, want to learn how this synth actually works. All right, so here we are on the front panel of the OBX8. As you can see right here, the synth is absolutely massive and barely even fits in frame with my camera. 
So starting off, we're going to initialize a patch with manual and write, and we've got a basic VCO saw wave. Just sounds amazing from the start. Let's bring up a bit of release using the envelopes. We'll use that sound for the rest of the video, but just a quick shout out, I love the way the sustain pedal works on this synth, where if I press the sustain pedal, it then triggers the release, which is amazing. We can configure that how much the release works, but I wish every sustain pedal worked like that rather than just holding the sound forever. Okay, cool. So let's go through the oscillators to start with here. So we've got two oscillators here and the oscillator section is easily one of my favorite things about the synth. So either we can do saw, pulse. If we have neither of them selected, it's a really nice triangle wave. Or if we have both of them, we get a really interesting sound that might sound a little weak at first, but it's basically a brand new waveform that essentially has a couple of saws layered on top of each other. We also get control of pulse width, and I'll show you that with the regular square wave in a second, but I think it really shows the magic of this double waveform because while it sounds weak on its own, when you add pulse width, it really starts to get thick and big, and it's not actually doing what the OB6 does, for example, where it's half of it is a pulse width square and half of it's a saw. It's creating an entirely new waveform, which is really cool and adds a lot more versatility than one might expect on the surface. So moving on, uh, we've got oscillator two here, so let's go back to saw for now. And right over here, we have our oscillator two D2 knob. So if we go, How amazing does that sound? Uh, I'll talk about it later in the pros and cons, but there's just something magical about the way that the Oscillator 2 detune works on this synth. I'll play a little bit more around with this patch just as is so you guys can see, but I've never heard something so simple sound so good. I don't know what it is about these VCOs, but they just sound incredible. Check this out. So we'll add some release. Add some detune. Check out the same thing with square waves. Go down an octave. Like, yeah, listen to that. That sounds incredible. We're not even using pulse width. We're not even using an LFO. This is just the VCOs detuned against each other. Anyway, moving on. So we'll go back to saw for now. Um, but yeah, moving on to the pulse width section, we looked at this briefly. Um, although there's only one control, a shortcut is if you want to control the individual pulse widths, you just hold down the pulse button and then adjust. All right. We'll go back to that later when we check with the LFO, but for now, back to saw waves, like I said. Um, the other part of the oscillator section, which is really cool, is the X mod section. Um, so unlike something like the OB6 or Prophet 6, where you have a whole bunch of different features uh, that you can modulate with the X mod, a whole bunch of different destinations rather, this one is a bit more limited, uh, but it does work really well. So we have two options for X mod. One, which is a fixed saw X mod amount, which sounds pretty wild, to be honest. Pretty intense, right? So that's pretty much just used for FM. Um, but then the second one, which is a little bit more hidden, um, you press the page two button here and you're gonna go ahead and move oscillator to frequency. Let's see if we can see our screen here. And you see here the amount of triangle 
X mod is determined. Now this is more like what I usually use X mod for and I'm super happy it's here. So if we go to a triangle wave and start adding an X mod. We get that amazing FM sound that just, you know, that pure analog FM sound that just sounds so rich yet metallic. That could be a sound right there. Like just, just like that patches fall out of this thing. Like that riff right there. Beautiful sounding and all we've done is twist a couple knobs. We're going to turn off X mod for now and go back into saw. So we have our second oscillator enabled. We can also use oscillator sync here. For those classic synced sounds. Uh, the reason why you hear stepping there is because it tunes chromatically on the oscillators. Both of them can be tuned up or down uh, chromatically. But um, so one way you can modulate the sync smoothly, uh, either you can use an LFO, which we'll get to, or the F envelope mod button here, which is really nice, just enables the modulation to the oscillator two for those nice sync sounds or percussive pitch sounds. Got that classic sing sound if we put it in unison it's like the classic sync lead right cool so we're gonna take off sync for now bring back our oscillator take off f envelope and go ahead and bring back our modulation moving on so the filter section of course the star of the show on any oberheim analog synthesizer so if we grab our sound nice and rich already there are three filters on the OBX8. So the first filter, the one we've been hearing so far, is the SEM filter. I'll do a sweep. This is from originally the Oberheim SEM, but uh, more famously on the Oberheim OBX, uh, which was the first big polysynth we talked about in the intro. So sweeping it with no resonance. You notice it never gets particularly dark. This is that classic Oberheim fizz sound that you probably are familiar with and what you think of when you think of Oberheims. This is a very similar filter to what's found on the OB6. When we bring in resonance, we'll notice this is definitely one of the most uh, aggressive filters of the three, although none of them are particularly aggressive, they're all very musical. So let's bring up resonance. How amazing does that sound? We're on maximum resonance and nothing is harsh on the ears. It just sounds so musical and beautiful. You'll notice I'm using keyboard tracking on this synth. Um, it comes enabled by default, but we can turn it off. One thing to note is that without keyboard tracking on, the synth is quite dark. With keyboard tracking on. And I really do feel like uh, if you're going for a classic bright brassy Oberham sign, sound, sorry, uh, you're probably better off keeping it on. I'm gonna leave it on for the remainder of the video, but it is really nice to have the option to have it off for more dark pad sounds. Beautiful. So moving on, the next filter, and you know, I love them all equally, but if you had to make me pick, this might be my favorite, is gonna be the OBXA uh, two-pole filter. So this is a Curtis chip filter from the OBXA and the OB8. So it sounds like this with no resonance. You'll notice it's a bit warmer, a bit less buzzy but still being a two pole 12 dB per octave filter, it, it's got that nice kind of, you know, upper end harmonics that pass through. With full resonance, 
I love the resonance on this filter. Oh, let's turn on keyboard tracking, my mistake here. Lovely. And then finally, one of the most underrated additions that I wasn't sure how much I'd use, but I've absolutely loved it, is the addition of the four pole filter from the OBXA and the OB8. While in my opinion, the traditional Oberheim sound is that really bright kind of fizzy sound that a two pole filter gives, Having the four pole filter for those more classic profit or you know modern synth sounds is lovely. This synth, this synth filter for the four pole filter is just incredible. So again, with no resonance, you notice it gets a lot darker. I'm gonna play a couple chords here so you guys can hear just kind of how this sound would work. Let's add in a bit of filter modulation quickly. So it's different, right? It doesn't sound exactly like every other Oberheim filter you've heard. It's a lot darker. For example, if we went back to the SEM, that same sound. Much brighter. The one thing to note about this 24, uh, sorry, this uh, four, uh, yeah, 24 dB per octave low pass filter is as you increase resonance, it sounds great, but it gets really dark really fast. Pardon me, not really dark, it loses its base. I misspoke there, but. Notice how much quieter that is. I'm gonna boost the volume here a little bit. Beautiful, it sounds simply lovely with maxed resonance. An absolutely lovely sounding filter, but just bear in mind that if you're going to be going for those big, deep, floor rumbling basses, it's very, very musical, but it does not self-resonate, neither nor does it uh, have a bass compensation when you add in resonance. So something to bear in mind there. Okay, cool. So going down to the mixer, so we've already looked at the mixer here. Uh, we're going to go back to the XA12 dB uh, per octave filter. Um, so we can enable oscillator one or two. They are just buttons, but we can adjust the volume later in page two settings, which we'll get to in my section on page two. You can also add in noise. Again, I'm really happy to say that just like the OB6 and Prophet 6, it's a nice bright noise source rather than what the Moogs do where it's like a really like, you know, pink noise, low bassy noise source, which I never find usable. Um, and you can also, just like in the page two settings, adjust the exact level if you'd like. Um, but something I'd like to comment on for the fact that it's just, you know, buttons versus sliders, the Oberheim as an instrument is really well tuned so that nothing ever gets too much, you know, they've taken a lot of time and effort back as early as Tom Oberheim's first designs to make sure that every single part of this synth works together in a very musical way. So I rarely find myself having to go into page two and being like, okay, I'm gonna turn down oscillator two because it's overpowering in this sound. But if you want to, it's absolutely there, but it really does go a long way. Just how well tuned this instrument does uh, ends up being, it's very fast. Just if I'm like, I want the second oscillator. I don't want it. So I, in my, you know, two weeks having this synth, I haven't found it be a limitation, but you know, you can change it if you want. Uh, okay, final thing here, we already looked at keyboard tracking, but modulation, so that's gonna determine uh, how much of the filter envelope gets sent to the filter. Really great for making plucky sounds. Pretty much like anything you do on this synth is going to sound great. This would be a good opportunity to quickly go and do this the same pluck with the three sounds so you can three filters so you can hear. So the sem filter, XA, pretty similar but a bit warmer, and then the four pole. Really nice, right? Like it, it totally doesn't sound quite as Oberheimy anymore, but it's so warm and lush. Um, so let's go ahead and we will 
Uh, make a filter envelope shape for the sound we're making. So maybe something like this. <laughs> There you go, that's a good shape for brass. Okay, and right below it, we've got our volume envelope, pretty standard as well, ADSR. We've already kind of worked with that, so we'll leave it as is. Uh, and then next up would be modulation. So let's go ahead and check out our LFO settings. So not only do we have the one LFO here with the two modulation buses, uh, but we also have a dedicated vibrato LFO, which is fantastic. Super happy to see that. Uh, I know that's from the original Oberheims, but it did get lost along the way with, you know, the OB6, didn't make it on there, very happy that it's here now. So for the LFO, we basically get to choose our rate, and we can choose in page two whether it's going to be the uh, LFO modeling the analog LFO from the OBXA and the OBX, or the software LFO from the OB8, um, but overall, we'll just leave it on the stock one for now. So we'll, let's, let's go ahead and modulate the filter to start off with. We've got our different shapes, sine or square, sample on hold, and we can do the shapes in between which is either a saw down or saw up. Listen to how great that sounds. Amazing. Okay, we'll leave it on a sign for now and we'll just do a little bit of filter modulation. Just to give it a bit of movement. We'll take a look at the page two settings, but there's some really cool tricks you can do with the LFO um, that I'll get to when we get there. Uh, for the second bus, let's go ahead and uh, let's switch them to pulse width so you can hear what a pulse width modulated sound sounds like on this synth, because I must confess it's amazing. So. Modulate both both uh, of the pulse width. Like, how great does that sound, right? Like, there's there's something magic about these oscillators hitting that filter, I must confess. Amazing. Um, so we'll go back to our saws for our sound, but just wanted to show you how great that sounds. Uh, my favorite addition here, which was not on the OBX, I believe it was introduced on the X... A or the 8, I'm not sure there, someone feel free to correct me in the comments, is the volume modulation. So we can do great like tremolo sounds for electric piano. Beautiful, right? So overall, you know, even though it's just one LFO with two buses, really great uh, the amount of stuff you can do. So we're gonna go ahead and dial it back pretty subtly. Just add that, you know, liveliness to it. Uh, and then down here, we've got our second vibrato LFO, which is super, super important. So enable the oscillator one and two, bring in the depth. Obviously it's crazy, but dial it back a bit and we've got that classic sound I love to make but with more modulation because we have an actual other LFO to do something other than just vibrato. Incredible sounding, right? Let's dial it back a little bit so you guys don't get seasick, but 
We haven't even touched on some of my favorite features, so we'll, we'll jump over here. I know we're not going in order, but I figured it might be more helpful to go in the order that I'd actually make a sound on this thing. Um, so next up, we have our vintage knob. So we've been using it with no vintage knob, and it already sounds amazingly vintage, but we can just go and crank that in. And it just smears the sound. It's really hard to overdo the vintage knob here. It sounds great. It sounds great if I play the right chord. So that's full, and here's none. Pretty subtle, but I tend to leave it right about here and it just brings the sounds to life. Amazing. We've got portamento, polyphonic portamento, which is a classic Oberheim sound. It might be easier to hear if I turn up the sustain for a sec and turn it down a bit, but something like this. Incredible. And then, of course, one of my most favorite modern additions that you would expect, but it need, none of the old Oberhams had this, which is the addition of velocity and aftertouch. So. My, I tend to use it on the filter, but you can use it on volume as well. And you can adjust these curves in the settings, uh, in the page two settings if you like. So filter, and we'll grab the aftertouch to the filter as well too. Makes it just a lot more expressive. It's a win-win. Almost have it on on every patch, but if you do want to experience the old school Oberheim presets, none of them have velocity and aftertouch. Uh, and then finally, unison. We already looked at this briefly, but you can actually layer all of the different uh, voices together so we get a big fat eight voice sound. This is probably where vintage mode comes in handy the most. So if I go, and then I bring in vintage all the way, gets a lot more fat. We can even adjust the detune more in a page two setting called voice detune range, uh, which we'll get to again in page two. Uh, but yeah, that's that's gonna be this section covered right here. Um, so the only other sections to cover are gonna be this last part here before we will jump to a new angle and check with the page two settings. Uh, but essentially we've got our master volume. We've got, you know, volume balance, which in single mode like this is gonna adjust the um, the volume of the preset, um, you know, that comes in handy if you're using that uh, four pole filter, which is much quieter. Uh, and then the tune. Because it is a fully analog synthesizer with a 100% analog signal path, it can get out of tune pretty easily. Um, and if we do want to tune it to an instrument, we use that. But if we want to tune it to itself, click that handy tune button. So the last part before we get into the page two settings and the split and double mode is going to be the arpeggiator. So we get there by changing mod to arp and enabling arpeggiate. You can't really hear it with a sound like this, so let's go ahead and turn it down to something much more basic. We can also do something kind of cool where we hold it. And then we can play over it. But overall, like you guys know for me, I like to play my synths live or sequence them in the DAW, so I almost never use the arpeggiator, but it is there if you need it. As for hardware, we've got these really funky bend levers, which are opposite. One feature I do like is you can very quickly change it so it goes up or down an octave, or back to just two. You can change the specific amount in page two, but those are the two most common ones, and it's awesome that you have a button for it. You can also do some funky things like making it so only oscillator 2 gets bent. 
And this is also where we control the transposition. So a big criticism I have of this synth right now, which again can be patched in firmware, is you can only go down one octave or go up one octave. So hopefully they change that in firmware. Now for the page two settings, probably the single most important thing to do, in my opinion, is to go into global and go until where it says page two edit mode and you can choose panel plus display. So it's defaulted to display only, which means you have to do all this menu diving, but with panel plus display, you basically have a shift button and then you turn knobs for shortcuts. It's a great fix and I really do hope they add with firmware updates more of the things like stereo spread to this shift function uh, menu so we don't have to menu dive for them. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and save our preset now that we're finished. And this is a good opportunity for me to show you how the split and double modes work. So we get there by clicking either split or double. So if we click split, we're gonna be taken into a bank of all split presets here. Not really a fan of that. Neither of that, let's see. Okay, there you go, there's a classic one. Right, so really great feature to be able to split the keyboard and have like a bass down low and chords up high. Uh, and double works kind of the same way. So double, we're gonna basically layer the two together. And I'm gonna show you double by essentially showing you how the actual patch loading system works and we'll load in the patch we just made on both sides. This will also give me a good chance to show you guys the page two settings about the stereo spread, all that good stuff. So bear with me a moment while we search for that. Click double to get into double bank. So for the lower, we're gonna go ahead and click the lower button and that's gonna choose what we load. We're gonna go in here. I think that basic program 15.3 is my preset. There you go. So it's playing something random on the other side, which will change now. So we choose upper to load the upper patch. Again, we'll go to OBX bank 15.3. So now, All right, so as we can see right now, it defaults to having one of them up or down an octave from each other, which is really annoying because I'm obviously doubling it to have them play the same. I really wish that wasn't the default. Hopefully they can change that in a future firmware update. But what you do to change that is you get rid of the upper. So you're only editing double, go to page two, and we're gonna go ahead and get rid of upper transpose. Okay, cool. Now they should sound like the same sound. All right, amazing. All right, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna go ahead and change the stereo spread so that we get that classic, fully unison, two voices playing at the same time, two patches, sorry. So we're gonna go ahead, go into page two, go through all these things. You guys can uh, check out Starsky Car's video if you wanna go through a detailed view of what all the different page two settings are, but they've got a ton of options there. We're gonna stick to the ones that I think I use the most. So we have option for pan mode, we've gone through, we've got you know mono that we were working in, Spread for the classic, uh, splayed, which goes from left to right up and down the keyboard, and then ping pong, we know alternates each voice. That's a really cool feature, but the one we want for unison, or left, or right. So now if we hear this. Hopefully all that work was worth it for you because wow, does that sound amazing. So now if I were to go. And we make modifications to each of them just to make them a little different, maybe a little more vintage, a little less detune on this side, and a little bit more detune on that side, a little bit of a lower filter. Or how about we make this one, one of them is a pulse wave. Like, wow, that just sounds incredible. Awesome, so that's split and double mode. Um, going through a couple of the final page two settings that I think are important. Again, I'm not gonna go through every single one of them, but as I mentioned, we've got oscillator one and two level and noise level, which is great. 
Um, and then we've got, you know, stuff like that you have shortcuts for, like the pulse width or the triangle X mod, which is important. Um, and then the rest of the settings, a lot of them are all about the LFO, which is actually worth looking at. It's pretty cool. So what we'll do here is we are going to go ahead and uh, take take off page two settings. We'll go back to taking off double. So now we should just have a single uh, single patch. <laughs> Awesome, so if we wanted to go into page two, and there is a shortcut for this as well, where we press page two, and then we add the mod one delay time, mod two delay time. So we can actually add attack and decay to our envelope. So this is probably easiest to hear with the uh, LFOs turned way up. Right, pretty cool. So essentially what happens is you actually get some pretty complex modulation. We can also do something pretty cool where we basically use the destination to to control the destination one's modulation. I'm actually just gonna undo what I just did there and get rid of the delay time, which can speed it up or slow it down. So this one we do have to menu dive for a bit, unfortunately. So what this feature allows us to do essentially is basically control the speed at how it ramps up or down. Pretty cool sound actually. The final LFO trick I want to show you guys is essentially you can actually have it so that the LFO is keyboard tracked, which essentially what that will do is make it so that you have different speeds up and down the keyboard. And you might think, oh, there's only one LFO, but there's actually two LFOs because of the fact it's a bitemporal synth. So in solo mode, what we can do is play a low LFO and it will be slower, and then a high LFO, and it will be faster. All right, so hopefully that gives you an idea of how it is to program the OBX8 and the kinds of sounds you can get out of it. So for the pros and cons. So the first big pro obviously has to be the sound. In my opinion, this is one of, if not the greatest sounding synths that's been released in the last 40 years. It truly sounds like a vintage Oberheim. And if you don't believe me, check out the videos from Marcus Ryle where he compares it to each of its older siblings. For the second pro, I've gotta give a shout out to the Heritage. It truly feels like you're playing a piece of history when you turn on the synth and start to play through those old presets. They've done an absolutely stellar job, like I mentioned, with making it sound spot on, but not only that, it feels spot on. The way that the knobs are laid out is very, very similar to the classic Oberheims, and I think it's inspiring me to write different kinds of music that I normally would, knowing the history that's gone into this machine. Thirdly, to get a bit technical, I absolutely love the oscillator section on this synth. On the surface, it seems a little bit limited, but these are the best sounding oscillators and honestly the most usable oscillators I've ever heard. Each of the modes, saw square, saw square mix, and triangle all sound amazing on their own, and there's just something magic about the way these oscillators detune across each other. Like, it's not just me, I don't know if you're hearing this, but it truly sounds like different than any other synth when I turn that oscillator to D2 knob up. Incredible stuff. For the fourth pro, I absolutely love that they've brought back a dedicated vibrato LFO. This has been my biggest gripe with my previous sequential instruments like the Prophet 6 and OB6 because I almost always find myself wasting the LFO just doing a little bit of basic vibrato to get that old school tape warble effect. On the OBX8, I have a dedicated vibrato LFO to do that, and I can use the LFO for more creative tools like tremolo or FM or whatever I would like. My cat was literally not leaving me alone there, but we are back. So, the cons. As great as this synth sounds, there are several pretty serious cons that thankfully can be addressed with future firmware updates, and I really hope that they do. First up, while I completely respect the fact that they're trying to make this as authentic to the originals as possible, there are some very weird limitations that they've kept in and they don't even allow you a global setting to change. For example, 
on the OBX8, you can only go down one octave or go up one octave. On all my other synths, you're at least allowed to go down two, if not more. This is very limiting because it means that I can't get down to certain notes that I would want to play on my keyboard or up to certain notes that I'd want to play without using the global transpose knob. By using the global transpose knob, then I throw all the other presets out of whack because they're not designed for that range. So it's a little frustrating, but all it would take is a firmware update. Similarly, the way the LFO works is very strange. Usually on most synths, when you max out an LFO, you're able to go essentially one octave of range. The quickest way to test this is if you change your shape to a square wave and modulate oscillator one's pitch, you should be able to get a smooth octave up and down sound. Now on the OBX8, they've taken faithful recreations of both the OBX and the OB8 LFOs, but unfortunately neither of them can do this very simple trick. Both of them have their uses, but I would love for them to add in the global settings a third software LFO that works a little bit more like the LFOs I'm used to, so I can do that trick of going up and down with a square wave, which is a classic sound I like to use a lot. The third con, and this one to me is really quite surprising why they didn't include this, is there's no way to control both of the layers at the same time. So if I want to create an initialized patch from scratch on any other bitambral synth, I can design two identical patches at the same time, and then once I'm done designing them, I can go separately to one or the other and make small changes. In the OBX8, you can't do this. You have to load two separate patches and edit them as two separate patches. This seems very frustrating, because what if I was playing live or recording in live, and I wanted to modulate the filter on both patches? I can't do that. And finally, my biggest con, the page two settings do end up being quite a bit more menu divey than I would have hoped for a synth that is this much of a flagship and this much about the feeling and the hands-on experience. Well, there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this video on the Oberheim OBX8 and you learned something about the synth and perhaps the history of Oberheim as well. Let me know in the comments below what you think and if you think that this synth is worth its incredible asking price. I must confess for me, as much as this became instantly the most expensive purchase in my studio, it's pretty much taken over as the only synth I play, and it's really given me a new appreciation for the history of synthesis. Thank you guys so much for watching, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss my future videos, including my in-depth comparison of the OBX8 with the OB6, and let's check out some sounds to play us out.